Yeah, now that poor Amumu sitting on the bench again. Rek'Sai's going to get banned down an insta jana there for yeah, Flying Jew. But they didn't really want to engage on them hard that time. They wanted to kite and poke. So they can run a kite poke comp very, very well with one heavy engager. If Jana needs to keep people alive and position herself around the team fight, after a while that ultimate becomes very hard to hold on to because you like to use it for the heal. So I feel that they can run exactly the same thing on the side of 4 minus the Aurelia, and still do that team fight perfectly fine. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, in game one I mentioned that Jana might have been the thing that pushes that comp over the edge for Enzo and playing that, you know, Kitan fight sort of comp. So we'll see what happens here. That's quite a bold hover though, and we could be changing things up pretty aggressively here for Fauna, but we'll see what they want to go for. Yeah, and Naya going, once again, looks like it will be the Wukong as well. So that hover on Cassidy, I won't talk about it until it's locked in, but it's a very smart hover because Cassidy is so versatile in mid and top at the moment and is versatile in build paths as well. So, oh, yeah. When we talk about flex picks just being so important, yeah. especially in the early stages of the draft, and now you can talk about it, Spawn, because that is Cassidy and Wukong locked in. Yeah, so the important thing about Cassidy is it does well against AD tops. A lot of people look at Cassidy as the anti mage, but if you stack some armor on Cassidy, the way that, because uh, you can't get bursted down because of your armor, your slows keep people in range so much that Tank Cassidy is actually a really good pocket pick if they run heavy AD compositions. Yep. We used to see Boy Boy play it in the LCS every now and again, and it's just one of those things that's super fun to watch. Yeah, and I, I like Nia's Wukong in the last game as well, so I like that he's returning to this particular champion. Just again, kind of suits Fortnite style. Very big, aggressive, Amumu-esque jungler as you described it. And, uh, ooh, gonna play pretty fancy here. Orianna's gonna get locked in. There we go. And the Draven's gonna go to Log Dog once again. Yeah, so they're like, okay, we are not seeing an Orianna Wukong ever again. That was terrifying. <laughs> That is what swung the game around. Even though CNJ came up huge, it was that one shockwave on top of the, the Wukong ultimate. So getting that one away, let's see what they use instead in their Wombo combo in the mid lane. Yeah, and maybe Fauna have the option of playing more of what we saw out of Easy in game one, if they want to go for that sort of comp as well. Not sure specifically on Moya's champion pool. We've only seen him play Orianna so far in this series, but if he plays something like a Zed and wants to go for that action instead, they can also do that. So Fauna, to me, it'd be surprising if they change things up, given how well they play together in big team fight comps that we'll have to see. Yeah, and I've called it a couple of times so far. We saw last night in the LCK how good Lulu mid still is, and I would love to see that come out. Xerath, of course, is a very strong pick, but just lacks the synergy, I feel, that really is needed for a big team fight team. And wow, CNG going for Graves. That's a that's a pretty brave pick into an Orianna. Yeah, definitely. A lot nah, of you swaps it out for the Ezreal last go. second. Sad times. But I mean, his Ezreal was fantastic in the last game. Can't fault him for picking it here again in this last game as well. And it is Xerath. Uh, yeah. Kind of goes with the siege potential that Fortnite have lacked quite a lot of, but I think I agree with you in that it doesn't quite fit the style that they've been playing so far. Yeah, and I just don't think it fits Kassanen whatsoever. I think that Kassanen excels in getting in there and really fighting. And uh, you mentioned it, Xerath is a poke champion. Sits back, likes to chunk people out. Doesn't really like to, uh, I guess, follow up on bursts unless they run it like the Eliup dunk contest where uh, Kassanen really slows people, chunks them out, and then Xerath just sits like 3,000 miles across the other side of the map and ults them to death. Potentially. I mean, they've got a lot of global or semi-global action between Ezreal and Xerath, so we could see some fun ones. I'm not quite sure which support they want to use to tie the room together either, but we've got picks coming through as well. Enzo and hovering a couple of different champions here. We'll wait a little bit to see, but uh, a very popular AD carry that's currently being hovered over would be really good in the sort of team. And I love how she plays with Jana. So we'll see what has to happen here. But it almost feels to me that Enzo are picking the comp that Fauna has run the last two games. Yeah, and we saw a Jana uh, Sivir, I think, in the IM game, and they just farm so well. Like, Sivir just pushes out lanes, gets you ahead so well early in the game. And my other favorite thing, I think, has to be Sivir Maokai. You know, you want you need to get your job in range. You want to get your Maokai in range for W. John, if she wants to go the old captain's boots that we saw uh, in Worlds as well, we can go for that. And Orianna can speed people up as well. So you have so much hard engage and so much mobility that Enzone can just brute force a 5v5 team fight. And this is hilarious to me because Enzone are trying to fight like Fauna have been fighting in the last two games. Yeah, and I was going to say, and Fauna can do to Enzone exactly what they did. If everyone goes in, Carlos' guy can just jump straight onto uh, Fence Boy, blow up that Sivir, and all of a sudden they're like, okay, so we have this big tanky heavy engage, and we have no damage left. And uh, this would be a great last pick if it comes through as well. I feel like as far as supports go, there's not that many options. Like we've seen a lot of Thresh, obviously, was still quite good. Jana, I feel like, is probably at the top of support picks right now, but the pool's quite shallow. 
And given the comp that Fauna have presented so far, I do like this last pick a lot. Nami's going to get locked in here, going to really supplement the disengage in team fight. But Fauna are all of a sudden going to have to play a very different game that they've already been playing for in, what, an hour and a half? Yeah, so they've completely swapped it on his head. They're going team fight against what looks to be like maybe even a catch comp coming out of Four Knot. So, yeah, I, I don't know how this game is going to play out. Just touching on the support point, it looks like OCE is starting to really. We have some great supports, don't get me wrong. The fact that Flying Jew is even in this uh, promotion relegation, I guess, kind of event just shows how good our supports are. We've got people like Egypt, people like Rosie that are still around the scene. But you hit it on the head. It looks like we're really tunneling on three picks in support. People are forgetting things like Alistair, things like Braun. We've seen Annie make a comeback. We saw a Syndra support last night. Like, come on, there is a wide champion pool out there for supports, and I think that we're really starting to fall behind in picking that up. Yeah, and again, I mean... John is just so good that I feel like you have to pick her. And Nami just fits his comp so well. But I, I'd love Braum. I think he doesn't get enough play in the whole uh, Jana nami sort of scheme of things. And Ali, as you mentioned, is really great as well. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, so I think... Trying that, not to die on stream. Yeah, I think the good thing about Alistair is that uh, he provides <laughs> that... If you don't have initiation, he gives it to you in support, and they're so rare. Him and uh, Leona are kind of the only two people that do that. Um, and if you look at the uh, composition that is Fawn on at the moment, they do need someone to be able to get in there with this Wukong, because if Carlos is God is the second person that goes in, he's going to get blown up, because Kassanen is not that tanky of a champion. Yeah, we'll have to see it. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm apparently... Whatever you had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In game one, I apparently have. Yeah, so and uh, so it looks like they've got a little bit of a, a different composition here coming out of Fortnite. I like the Ezreal as well as the Zereth. It kind of loses itself in, uh, I, as I said, the Kassanen. But if they can get catches, they have a lot of single target burst damage. We'll have to see what happens. That's the big thing. We've, we've turned so much. There we go. We've turned so much in these comps now between what we've seen already in these first two games, that what happens here is very different to what we've seen. So pretty curious to see what they do want to go for, because now, again, we've talked about the stars of these teams. They've kind of swapped to each other's style now for this last game here. And I don't know, I, it's hard for me to talk about Fortnite without them playing the champions they've already played in the last two games. Yeah, it, definitely. And I, I think the important part here is if Carlos is God can really dictate flow in top lane. I feel like he sets his team up so well. We saw that he went super aggressive on Aurelia as we do jump onto the rear. And uh, if he's able to dictate flow to Yuri again, it's just going to mean that they have so much more pressure in the mid game than what uh, I think that Endzone can bring. In saying that, if Endzone can execute successfully what Fournote were trying to do and really get them to the point where they've got these two potent carries with all the big tanks, then it's going to be to the point where it's just going to be too much damage for them to uh, be able to withstand. Yep, we'll have to see here as Rekt and Moya going to get amongst it early on. Just trading autos back and forth. Uh, Orion actually lost that battle somehow, but they do both put some wards down. Rekt will go back to base with all the very adorable Poros. And we'll reset a little here for level one. Haven't seen any uh, invades to start things off here. So going to keep things pretty casual, it seems like. Yeah, it certainly does. And it looks like that they're just setting up exactly standard like they've had. We've not seen very many shenanigans coming out. Nice line of wards actually coming out from Fortnite at this start of the game at the bottom side of the map. Um, but it looks like junglers will be on opposite sides once again, going with those Krugs first. Yep, we do have a pause. I'm going to try not to die on stream again. Apologies for that. Again, whatever you had, I may have caught, hopefully not though, but I mean, maybe it's just all the excitement here because it's been such a great day of League of Legends. We've got games tomorrow as well. Don't forget, two more Best of Series coming up as well, so don't forget to tune in tomorrow. Same time as well, 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time for all those pesky times. There's a lot of them actually in this region, but getting into this game a bit more, not, not super surprising to see not that much aggressive level one stuff. But to me, it's a little surprising we haven't seen that much Lee Sin. And it seems like Naya in particular is just a very different jungler to a lot of the junglers we've seen maybe earlier today in, say, the immunity set. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I really like that. I like the fact that uh, obviously jungle is now a much more diverse role that you can take different things into. I like the fact that Wukong's made a resurgence. I think he's a very exciting jungler. I want to see that Amumu get through at That's some point. Um, what I wanted. But yeah, yeah I, I really like the fact that uh, you can bring CC heavy junglers, you can bring tank heavy junglers. I'm waiting for Sejuani to be played. I think she's really strong at the moment. And uh, as I think we've resolved some of the technical issues, so we will be jumping into the game fairly soon. But yeah, I like the fact that ch uh, the champion pool for jungle has brought him back out. I agree. And Sejuani, as you mentioned, is just is great fun. And so much experimentation is happening in the jungle. We kind of mentioned already that once you get out of the top tier junglers, 
It's not like before where we might have had, say, here's top two or top three junglers, and here's two or three more, and then just a bunch of people that no one wants to play. It's like, here's two or three junglers, and then here's literally every other champion in the game. Oh, uh, yeah, certainly. And I've seen some crazy things being jungled. Like, we saw Fizz a lot last season. I think he's fallen off a little bit. Minions but it's like spawn. Lulu, TF. I, I mentioned Karma. Even Karma's being jungled at the moment again. Um, so, yeah, I think that there is a lot of potential for this uh, jungle pool to really explode. Well, standard lanes, it seems like. You'll have to see what happens. Fence Boy just kind of hanging out here. Fallen up, being a little bit cheeky. Hanging out on that bottom side of the brush. But looks like junglers are both going to start on their Krogs once again here. So... They'll end up on the opposite sides of the map and gonna pick up their red buff as their first major buff here. And Log Dog, I like that he's still here on Jarvan because Jarvan is not only just such a good jungler in this particular on this particular patch in this metagame, but he's done fantastic work on this champion. Yeah, I, I'm surprised that they're playing so aggressively on the side of Fornot after they saw what Log Dog did to them last time. Like with uh how he just level two ganked and was able to pick up first blood. Maybe not looking to do it on the Nami and the Ezreal because they are a little bit more tricky to lock down with the movement speed that comes out of Nami early in the game. But it looks like there will just be standard farm lands as Maokai actually picks up Wraith Camp for himself, grabs some wards, uh, a ward and some potions, and burns his teleport to get top lane at level two. Yeah, and he's already that level two as well, which is just so great uh, early on. So we'll see if this makes a bit of a difference at all in this particular lane. Carla, so you know level one's gonna feel a bit pressure, but he's doing the smart thing here, I think. Just taking his bottle with the crystalline flask up in the top, got his potions, he just wants to stay safe and farm, just like Yuri did in game one. Yeah, and it looks like Yuri runs a specific room page to do that as well. Looks like he has some AP built in there as well as his ring to be able to ensure that he can get that early level two. So if you're looking to replicate that, I'm pretty sure he's got an AP blue and a couple of uh, uh, three AP quints on there um, to make sure that he has enough damage to take out those uh, Raptors. And it's cool that we've seen a lot of top laners. Jax is another one that comes to mind where people have adjusted to taking camps because they just, they're quite hard, but if you can do them, they give you so much early benefit with the golden, especially the experience that they give. For me, Spawn, I almost feel like double jungling is criminally underexplored in this particular metagame because when you if you can get through those camps they just give you so much benefit yeah i think the only uh thing that double jungling isn't doing at the moment is it make sure that there's a lot of non-map pressure and because of how strong early dragon is if you double jungle on the wrong side of the map as the first gate comes in burns a flash so early log dog just loves this early ganks on Garvin. but if you give away that first dragon it is so crucial yeah, and that's a good point. You just, you can no longer give away the map control that you may be used to. A Spence boy in trouble. Bubble will be flashed but Naya's dive through a good exhaust for flying through. He'll burn down as well, and he might just survive here. We'll get under his turret safely. Forced to back, though. But no first blood force coming, but I like that Naya's being a bit more aggressive in the early game. Yeah, I certainly do. I'm a little bit confused as to why Naya actually just eat to that minion, because they had a perfect freeze there, and they could have got Fence boy off a lot of CS if they had have done that. But, yeah... Really well played by the bottom lane. CNJ looking to get ahead early, which he did not do last game. Remember, he was bullied around a little bit in that lane, fell a little bit behind. But once again, we're seeing Moya not struggle mid lane, but without that flash, he's going to be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, you're right about the freeze as well. Looks like Logdog going to come back again here. There's so many creeps. They cannot fight anywhere near this. Yeah, can't come in here. Flying dude's like, we're going in. I'm like, uh-uh, get out. Already took too much damage. Sivir will return to the lane as well. Cannon creeps in particular do so much damage early game. Like, you cannot fight anywhere near a cannon creep unless it is hitting something else, not you. Yeah, I like Fence Boy pulling his minions away as well. You're right about that, Freeze. Uh, Fence Boy not going to miss a single minion in terms of uh, under his turret or getting pushed in early, but having maybe a bit of trouble without Janna last hitting is so the loss of Flying Dew just temporarily in the lane. That thing felt a little here, but Siva going to be comfortable. Early tier, actually, for CNJ. Able to farm up quickly, push that lane, and that, I guess, there's the advantage, where he's able to go back and get a very early tier for himself. Yeah, definitely was able to do that. As we see, a gank coming in from Naya. No CC here, though, so Yuri just going to be able to stroll out. We'll be able to teleport. No, it's not back up, so not going to be able to get back to that lane. May lose some CS. Yeah, nice bit of pressure. Naya may be doing a little too much of that in this particular game. He's only level 3 still. Darwin is now level 4, and... They've both been pressuring quite a bit, but potentially a bit of overpressure here by Naya. He's going to help Carlos in the top lane push that in. Moya struggling a bit here against Oriana, getting outpoked, which is pretty, I think, pretty normal in this matchup. Yeah, and I think that uh, Logdog is forcing Naya to put this pressure, but Jarvan is just so much better pre six than uh, Wukong could ever imagine to be. Wukong really depends on that ultimate to be able to impact the game in a massive way. It does so much damage as well as the knock-up. So if they could make a decision and say, hey, Logdog never gets level 6, but Wukong never gets level 6 either, I reckon they'll take that trade. 
I think so too. Kind of interesting stuff that's happening as well in this minute. So you do see Wrecked and Moya just trade back and forth. 43 to 36 with Oriana currently in the lead as, as far as CS goes. And again, just keeping that ball nice and forward here and just really zoning Moya out of his own lane, which is kind of weak because Zerath's such a long range champion. He's known for the poke usually. Yeah, he certainly is. He will be able to farm fine. Zerath's one of those uh, champions that you get a couple of uh, levels in his uh, Q. After three levels, you can just Q, uh, I think it's either backline and it's just completely gone. As Naya coming in for another oh, game. Really sneaky. Rex forced to flash, does so instantly and will EQ out of the way. Has to dodge the ultimate, but can't dodge them all. And Moya nails first bite with the second bolt. Yeah, and we talked about how he was starting to get bullied around. That's a great response from Naya coming in, helping his laner out. Going to be able to tax a little bit of experience as well, meaning that he might be able to get six off the buff. That's so key. Yeah, and just a really nice bit of pressure. And that Oriana matchup, which was a little bit irritating, I think, for Moya there. Turned around by a beautiful decoy yank there from Naya. So, first of all, we'll go to Fornot here. And I think that's the big difference. Fornot, I don't think, have ever been in a good early game position in this particular game. Yeah, no, they certainly haven't. As we see, Carlos has got actually dictating flow of this uh, top lane in quite a way as well. He's up 8 CS, even though he did get a little bit chatted with the early level 2 from Maokai coming up. But that gank to force Maokai back just set him up in a perfect way. He's got that Catalyst versus the double Duran, so he's looking very pretty for maybe a 12-minute uh, Rod of Ages as well. Yep, and of course, by game moment, series is Fence Boy is farming down the bottom here with Flying Dew. Pretty even between the two AD carries. Double Dorans there versus Tier Plus of Dorans there. Uh, over on Ezreal, but Siva not really aggressively pushing this lane like we might expect with the Jhana. In fact, CMJ going to get that meaning we're pretty close to that turret. Friends point flying do slow playing their lane a little. Yeah, I don't know if it's a deliberate choice to try and get some ganks down bottom and try and shut down CMJ early because we saw what happened last game if he got rolling. Um, but yeah, as you said, Siva not expending any mana to try and push this lane up and really take advantage of how good her and Jana can, uh, I guess, pressure turret. And this might just be a really aware play. You mentioned that Wukong, his level 6 is probably coming up quite soon, just given his movements, even though he was quite aggressive from level 3 onwards. If that's true, uh, Easy cannot afford to be pushed ahead when Wukong comes in, because that's a really clean double kill. Yeah, it certainly is, and it looks like they are just looking to farm this lane out, give uh, the second buff over to the mid laners respectively, may try and shove those ones out. Neither jungler is level 6 as of yet, but they will both get it off their blue buffs. Yep, so we'll have to see here. Looks like Skirmish is Saber versus Rangers Trailblazer. Wukon probably needs a little bit more help in that jungle, so they're going to go for the, uh, the axe weapon there. Blue buff will go over to Wreck there. Logdog will hand that one over. And everyone's just kind of having a good old time here. Four not haven't done too much else after that uh, early kill, but actually 800 gold ahead is quite significant just nine minutes in. Yeah, and I think it's all coming from that top lane. Carlos has got is now 23 CSR uh, in this game. Really looking strong on this, Cassidy. And just the Aurelia play was fantastic, but even without an aggressive build, is still controlling this lane really well. Yeah, and maybe quite comfortable on champions. You know, just kind of hang out and farm in the top lane. We always joke that, you know, that's the job of the top laner here, but we've seen what happens when Kastanen gets items here, and Kast is going to have a very secure lane there, isn't Ooh, Naya? Logdog needs to be so careful. The range of Zareth is so important. Dude, that was odd. I think he's actually trying to lure him in there. Naya's going to die for you. Pops his ult, but EQ's enough. Here comes the Zareth, though. Last bolt, not quite enough damage. And that's going to be a deny kill, but I love the synergy between the mid lane and jungle And if they recognize people. that Orianna went back, they can drag him now for free, but... Doesn't even look like they want to go anywhere near it. Maybe a little bit of a miscommunication coming out of Fortnite because that was completely free. Two people back. And Fortnite are not the team that, but Fortnite are not the team that we've seen. You know, make aggressive early game calls here. So you do have a bit of a trade in the two v two. Here looks like jungle and mid lane are rotating through as well. So we're gonna have plenty of support here. Good tidal wave, but we'll get dodged by the special little block. I should say. Good damage coming through. Forcey on the heart slow just misses. As Fonta will flash in, that's a great Duke from Flying Jew as well. And Four Knot, nothing giving there. We'll poke them back off. Maybe now they go for the Dragon, but if not, they've wasted quite a lot of resources. Yeah, they can't go for the Dragon at all. They've got three Oom characters, and they're just trying to put Xerath back up the uh, mid lane into his lane. Needs to be careful from Rex here. If he gets uh, Ariana altered, he's in a lot of trouble. Yep. Drew gonna bust forward, try and look for the slow log dog, finds a knockup. There's a great tornado as well. Easy shockwave there as Rex picks himself up a kill. And now maybe now Enzo's gonna go in for the dragon. In fact, they will start it here. Yeah, that was really poorly played by Fornot. They're getting caught out. Never walk back up river if you're not taking your jungler with you. Just walk through the jungle. There's no point in even risking it. 
Naya may come in for a steal here. No first dragon going over to uh, EZ here, so getting themselves in a nice early position. Yeah, and again, this is sort of the story of the last two games as well. Endzone have just been so good at taking control in the early stages and just landing well. And I guess the wheels kind of fell off a little when Fournot were just so good in the late game, given how the, the, the draft and the items kind of fell out. I think Fournot maybe just don't play well with the lead because they're not they're not an early game team from what we've seen. They love to get to those late stages and big big team fights. Yeah, and it does look like they like to farm out. Maybe they're just a team of people that want to keep things in equal lanes as long as possible and get their items and then try and win with late game synergy. We see uh, teams like even old school M5 CLG EU that only play well when they are five people together. And there are teams like that have existed. So if that's their strength, they should definitely play like that. They just need to make sure they don't give away early advantages the way they have been. Yeah, and it's one of those things where they kind of got an early advantage. We're like, we can convert this somehow. There's lots of good pressure, but maybe it's uncomfortable in that situation. And in that case, just farm a little bit more. Get get slight edges in your lanes. You know, maybe keep that freeze going in the bottom lane that you mentioned. Or run all the mid lane creeps into the mid tower and try and deny some more. Just take little edges. Don't overburden yourself thinking, oh, we have to get this dragon and then everything just goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. And especially burning things like flashes to trade flashes. Like the communication should have been like Civis Flash is still up, just pull out of the game. Now that you've given up your flash, you're Zerith. Without your flash, you're completely immobile. At least Civis still got a spell shield and not that much CC in the bottom lane to really lock her up. So I think maybe just a little bit of overcommitment from Fortnite to try and get something to happen in that situation. And I, I think we might even just be on a timer now where can Endzone maneuver this game into a position where they're strong enough in the mid to mid late game? Where or if Fortnite are just going to get to you know four, five, six items again and just have the late game team fights that they've shown so much prowess in both these games. Yeah, I think it really depends on who gets stronger. Whereas CNJ gets really strong, or whether Yuri gets strong in this game. Because Maokai, you you think Renekton's annoying to kill? Try and kill a Maokai with his ultimate up. He's just going to have so much. CC able to stick on top of Ezreal, be able to follow him all around that map with that Tristan advance, and then have all the damage mitigation of his ultimate. I think conversely though, Carlos is God's Cassidy, and we are going to jump back into this game. That man right there, he is the he is the other carry to look out here for on Four Knots team. Yeah, he certainly is, and we saw that there was they were expending in game one. Four Knot were expending a lot of our ultimates to try and peel Cassidy. If the same thing can happen here, you're exactly right that they might just set themselves up to the point where Carlos's God can really carry his team. And it's nice to have kind of another mobile damage trait here to kind of complement Israel. It's uh, not quite the game one comp that uh, Endzone had in their game, but uh, it's kind of a, a hybrid of the first two comps we've seen from both teams, I guess, here. Is, again, Cassidy's struggling along beautifully here. His Rod of Ages is very close to completion if he doesn't already have the gold. Yeah, I think to he picks it up right now there. Yep, he's going to come through and he'll pick up his Rod of Ages. You saw him just buy... 1,500 gold worth of items, that's got to be a roll for Cassidy. Yeah. And 12 minute rod of ages is beautiful timing. We, I think 15, 16 minutes is acceptable. Uh, anything later than that, it starts to get a little iffy. 12 minutes is be is wonderful here. And uh, Carlos has got going to return to his top lane and keep farming it out. And we mentioned that's kind of what Fortnite likes to do. Fence Boy does miss the spell shield. And we'll eat a nice goo there from CNJ's Ezreal. But Madam Muno is done now. Things are chugging along here for the, uh, I guess, the two charging items that both uh, Ezreal and Cassidy have here on Team Fortnite. Yeah, and that's another way to look at the game. When you do build these items that take a while to get going, of course, very gold efficient, both of them, but they do need to stack up. Then, yeah, they just need to play safe at this point of the game and hope that they can get themselves over this little speed hump. We're seeing Morella and Omicron versus uh, the Athenes in mid lane. Uh, Moya seems to favor that a little bit more, and we are seeing that uh, Korea particularly still does stick to the Athenes. Yeah, we'll have to see here. As we continue fighting in the bottom lane, Flying Jew, by the way, just went in again. He might be like King of the Spell Thieves, because he loves to get in and just get his gold. Yeah, well, it's really important for... Uh, people look at Jana and say she does so much without items. She does even more with items. She scales beautifully with AP, just because of how her shield works. And then you put things like Mikhail as an important item on top of her, particularly CC, and she can do a really good job of peeling. So, yeah, as much gold as you can get on your support, the better. Yep, Yuri actually going to dive through the Carlos. We'll just riff walk out, though. And that Marco is starting to get bullied a little bit here, which is a bit strange. Naya here in the top lane. We'll just take out this pink ward, so Yuri's vision, not safe for now, but no gank forthcoming with Wukong getting spotted off there. And the tree, I think, maybe is not having a very fun time. He's 30 CS down, in fact. Yeah, he certainly is having a rough time now. As well, the teleport coming in behind them in the bottom lane. Oh, this is beautiful placement here. Fence boy could be in trouble. Can't spell shield in time. Does get slowed down here. The spell shield will come through. Does get popped there and nowhere to go. Kill will go. Wanted to go to CNJ. Does go to Carlos's God. 
and maybe we can look to collapse on the dragon as well. Yeah, it's really smart play from Carlos there to try and not pick up the kill. He recognizes that Ezreal needs to get ahead. However, able to secure it in the end. In yep. the meanwhile, Maokai has been able to push up the top lane and maybe get the turret down. So that's good response. But overall net profit on the side of Fournot. Yeah, maybe would have liked to see just an attempt at the dragon by Fournot there. I think they probably could have brute forced, but Yuri did have his teleport though. Yeah, and it is down at the moment, so probably why oh, they didn't yes, go near it. That would make a lot of sense. That's there's a reason you're the color commentator, Jake. <laughs> As Carlos does return to his top lane, we'll continue to farm things out and try and pad that farm advantage just a little bit more. Yeah, has picked up the uh, sword boots as well. His flying Jew holds the lane. Wow, what a nice support player there, taking a little bit of damage, but making sure that not going to allow them to get. That's a really good freeze, actually. That's all. Uh, that, oh, no, it's not. Fence boy ruined it. But I was about to say that is a perfect minion wave that it just got held off the turret. Well, you know, flying Jew, making sure give Fence boy all the options. Fence boy says, "Thanks, mate. I'll push this one out." He proceeds to ricochet and boomerang it down. I like that he also sniped Zelda with a tornado for a bit of extra spell thieves gold. Yeah, and maybe they're just looking to try and get some uh, objectives controlled on this map. They're recognizing that it is getting a little bit out of hand, that Fournot are playing their game, so trying to split it up. As we see an aggressive Wukong dive in there. Yeah, Naya trying to position here, and now the Dragon, when it comes back up in a minute 35, will be hotly contested by these two teams. Tower does go down in the bottom lane. Tycho's blessing, though, as Naya's going to come through. Ooh. Good slow there on the fine June, the tidal wave. Slowly, slowly coming in. Away. Yeah, really nice. They drew good split though. Maybe going to be able to get out. Great exhaust as well, but Fence Boy has found himself in trouble. That's a great tornado to defend, but Fence Boy's got nowhere left to go, and Drew did everything he could and still couldn't save his AD carry. Yeah, Zelda's tidal wave though was so good though. That was the perfect positioning, even though it didn't hit, and made Drew hang around for so long. Good ultimate in the end from Drew to try and split everyone up, but just such a good play out of Nami that really secured that kill for her team. And Yuri's actually TP'd back to his lane, it seems like, but might get forced out again here. Bottom tower's going to go down, so Fauna will answer the bottom turret with the bottom turret for themselves here. Two to one now, still in favor of end zone as far as turrets go. Yuri getting bullied around a bit. He will not have his teleport up if, when Dragon comes back up. I don't think Cast will either, but it's much closer. Yeah, he's having a lot of trouble. And with the fact that it's a Kassan and Zareth, I kind of disagree with Double Dorans into the uh, roller at this stage. We said 16 minutes is fine. That's kind of like the maximum time you want to get a roll. But you feel that he's not going to be doing that much damage regardless. He needs to just get tanky for these mid-game fights. We'll have to see here. Poke just running out there from Zareth. Land's actually going quite nicely here for Rekt, who's uh, played nice on his Cinder, of course. Very different matchup here, Zareth versus Oriana. But Merlin Nomicon plus uh, probably a rabbit on Zareth, I'd have to guess, with the need to see large rod. A little slow there for Oriana. They could get Cassid and... Or maybe even uh, Wukong ulti there as well. And looks like Fauna actually, oh, that's a nice ult. Going to come through as well. We'll be okay. Nye going to dive through. Just a bit of a poke. They're using that E, trying to zone away from that Ezreal. But Moe is going to keep poking down. Stun lands onto Logdog as well. And Dragon is up. They might go for it now. Yeah, that is definitely a Dragon possibility. Sanjay is slightly low, but I think still healthy enough with Zelda to be able to take this Dragon. Moya, of course, not that much mana. In response, they're pushing out mid lane extremely hard, so they might be able to trade an objective for this, but they need to make sure they don't get trapped. Carlos zoning them off as well. This is 5v4 now. Turret does go down, and easy will move away. They're good ultimate, but Fence Boy takes a lot of damage. Great. Zerathol's Whoa. there as well. Whoa. Almost gets the double. Trusha Barrage. Might have been enough, but Carlos is able to chase through. Double slow there as well with the Force Bolt. Oh, it's a great tidal wave. Trying to catch him off. Finds Logdog. Flying Drew gets clipped by a Mystic Shot as well. So they turn it around and Carlos goes down immediately. Naya, though, will catch him onto Yuri. The tree is likely going to go down. Oriana keeping him alive for so long as Naya gets the chunked out by Rekt as well. What a stun there as Moyo's going to clean that out. Really nice play by both teams there, but three for one there plus the Dragon for four not. Yeah, and they're trapped in a really hard place now. If they don't... Oh. Nice ult, but it's not enough there. Flying Jew probably going to go down here. Naya just needs one more whack. Never mind, it goes to Zareth instead. And there's the ace actually completed as somebody got sniped there. C and J around the side picked off Jarvan as well. Yeah, it was actually able to pick up Sivir at the end of that fight, so really well played from C and J there. And Naya is impressing me so much by holding off on taking kills. He understands that he is not the person that needs to get fed this game. It is that Zareth in the mid lane. It is the Ezreal, so he's just holding autos. He's securing them where he needs to, or just letting them go to the carries on his team. So really well played. Carlos is God. We spoke about how Kassadin can play two roles, either that assassin or the person that just continually chases, slows down, lets people do it. And yeah, able to get in there and really set up that fight. Yeah, and you can just see how 
good of a lane Carlos has got his head here on this Cassidy because not only is still streets ahead in CS here uh, with 40 plus CS in the lead now, building up those items as well uh, on this Cassidy. Whenever he entered a team fight, there's problems. And I think Fortnite are recognizing that they have, you know, a slight lead here, but with the way their style as a team is set up and the way their comp is set up, they can start forcing more and more fights in this mid game. And pretty much every dragon fight, it's going to get worse and worse for Enzone. Yeah, and I think if we saw anything last game, as soon as CNJ gets that uh, Iceborne Gauntlet, that's when the game really starts turning around in their favor. And he's just picked that up. Blue buff is up. We'll be interested to see if they give it over to him because this game, unlike last game, Moya is also having a terrific game. And Zareth with blue buff is yet yeah, even better than Ezreal at this point. So they're giving that one over to him. And you have to say that all three lanes have really worked out in favor for Fortnite on this game. They haven't. And that's a first in this series. They've, you know, had fine lanes or even lanes, but they've never been ahead, I don't think, in the early game, in the uh, two games they've had already. So a very pretty looking position now for Fortnite. But... Enzone can definitely fight back here. Infinity Edge is a good way along to uh, winning the next few fights as well here. Siva has finished that wrecked as well. Must be close to whatever need to see Ladron. Like, he is currently seeking. Other than that, though, I think maybe maybe the sore spot to Maokai here in the top lane. You kind of already mentioned it, Spawn, but Carlos has just had a stellar lane, and Maokai just has not. Yeah, and Carlos, they're sending four people up here to gank him, and I don't even know if that will be enough as he jumps aggressively onto Flying Dew. Yeah, wants to trade damage there. He's kind of hanging out. Laughing back and forth there, runs back towards his tier 2 turret. Actually getting chunked a bit by Oriana. Has to be quite careful here. Willing to trade though, might have gotten shockwave. But meanwhile in the bottom wave, look what's happening. There's four members strong down there and they're just pushing in on the tier 2 turret. Looking to nearly turn this into a base race because they're confident by how much damage CNJ's doing. And they should be as well. Ezreal pretty good at pushing as well when if you're attacking empty turrets. That essence fuck helping out a ton. In that situation, top tower will go down there. But Carlos has got, he might not be able to kill anyone, but he can make it annoying here. His friends will get altered up. Zero Thoughts come through. Shiva's forced to flash out. Pops the ult as well to keep her everything okay. But Fortnite are going to get the better end of this deal. Carlos is probably going to go down here. as four members descend upon him. And base race on, ladies and gentlemen, here. Teleport's going to come through for Yuri now, looking to defend. But uh, that tree is not very tanky. Going to get aggressed on here. Good bubble. Will uh, make it make it work, and the inhibitor's looking to go down now as well. No teleports are available for Fortnite. They cannot defend the top side of their base. Yeah, and it looks like they're sending Moya back. All that boomerang play just falling short. So maybe even getting an inhibitor for not one in response, because they have to go back. They're still in their base. They're still going aggressive under the inhibitor turret. Yeah, Moya, no ultimate yet, unfortunately. Can't uh, deny those back to the big long range spell, but CNJ's going to go through. Fence oh. boy almost goes down. But Ezreal not going to get it that time. And everyone will reset here, but that's a win there for Fornot in that trade. They get the inhibitor, and Easy can't quite close that out. Yeah, and so Endzone, even if they had have gone perfectly equal, still would have lost that because it's a bottom for a top. Bottom inhibitor is the e easily the best inhibitor take in the game because of how much pressure it puts on you to stay away from objectives. Uh, look at where uh, that is, and now look at the top side of map for Fornot. Super Creeps are going to push in on that bottom side, and Fortnite are going to be able to pick up two free turrets on the top side of the map really easy, expand their lead even further. Yeah, and an Abyssal Scepter actually was the buy. I was wondering what a Blasting Wand and a Nomadic Mantle were doing in the same inventory, but it is Abyssal Scepter now. Uh, Kassadin may be doing a bit of a... Uh a bit of a hybrid of the build we were talking about before. Wants to still do damage and be aggressive, but wants to be tanky. and know he's going to be kind of a bit more in the front line. Yeah, well, I think what's happened is he's recognized that uh, Rex is the damage sword. So, as, wow, Yuri gets chunked. Yeah, CNJ coming in. He's got those items sticking away. Dive actually might have come out here. Cast has got his tanking the turret here. CNJ will look to trade over. He's just standing here tanking. And Naya coming in as well to secure that kill. They'll take the turret here as well. Three members committed there for Fortnite up towards the top. I have to be a little bit careful, but Zareth will zone them off with Nami here as Enzone are trying to find a foothold back into this game, but Fortnite keep finding advantages. 5,000 gold ahead now. Yeah, and what's happening is they're getting kills and then turning them into objectives. This is not what they were doing in first the, uh, game one. As we see them trying to come in now, they need to be so careful. Flying to may get aggressive. Yeah, them. he's going a little too far. Forced to use the Monsoon very early to reset. Zareth poke going to come in. Now the Tidal Wave will follow. So we'll just lose, but there's the Zareth ultimate. CNJ gets that one kill. Wreck almost... 
lives up to his namesake there, will go down to Ezreal, he gets the double kill, and Fornot, every edge they get, they are turning into a big, big snowball, and it is being shoved down the hill. Yeah, it certainly is, and Sanjay on this Ezreal is the person that's doing most of the moving. Six, zero, and four. He's an absolute beast, and wow! Just going in there, just diving through there with that ultimate there from Naya's Wukong. Yuri in trouble is going to go down there as Naya picks himself up. Yet another kill. Logdog getting poked out from under his own turret. That's going to be another inhibitor here for Fornod, it seems like. No one left to really defend, and I think even if they were all up, Enzo would not want to try and fight this 5v5, and Fornod, we had two pretty long games here, Spawn, but Fornod are going to try and make this a very quick affair. Yeah, they certainly are. They're moving on to the inhibitor turrets now. Colossus has got has to be oh, careful. Oh, good stun. Wrecked. Going to get wrecked there. CNJ will pick him up. And they're going to take out in a Nexus turrets now as well. Excuse me, this Naya. Fucking out one. Yeah, I think it is. Two turrets go down almost simultaneously. Easy trying to defend their best fence by getting ripped to shreds by CNJ. Logdog's going to try and do it again, but he's going to go down. Flying Jim in the back is trying so hard, but there's a the teleport going to come in. That should secure this game. And four not in very quick fashion. Under 25 minutes takes the third and final game of this best of three. Yeah, and really big shout out to Zelda in that game. He had a pretty decent series, but 0-0 zero and zero 15 on that Nami. He had a stellar last game. And, I mean, that was a stellar last game from Fornot. From a team that had played pretty slow in their first two games and been very comfortable in late game situations, to just really flip the switch and be like, we're ahead. After the one mistake they made where I thought, oh no, the wheels might be falling off a bit. They're not playing to their strengths. they just like, you know what? We, they found 18 minutes, I think, found their mid-game and just didn't stop. Yeah, and really, once again, decisive shot calling. We're like, you know what? We can base race this. Carlos can defend much better than what uh, Siva can in the bottom lane. Unfortunately, Fenceboy was getting so bullied out by that Wukong underneath that turret. Nearly even died. That would have even made a bad uh, situation even worse. And yeah, just really smart shot calling to get that equal trade and then yeah come through with a big win and i think in such a, a long series actually again we had two f almost 50 minute games and then somehow a 25 minute game to finish things off both teams played really well in this series and i'm glad that it's double elim in this tournament so we're going to get to see both these teams at least one more time if four not are going to play like they did in the first two games and then have a game that good is their last game if they keep playing like that if they play like game three every game this team is they're, they're qualified. They're just playing so well. Yeah. And that third game especially was a big highlight. Yeah, and you just see how much better they play when Moya's really on point. I don't think much changed in that game apart from the fact that Moya exploded. 5-1-7 and seven on that Zareth. We questioned the spot that it ran in the team comp, but was just able to poke people out. And he was he, like a fine wire and got better with age. Really did there. And unfortunately, that does wrap up our broadcast for today, guys. I'm Julian Page. I'm guys. This is Jake Ponte. Join us again.